Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of Colonel Patrick Howell, the director of the Modern War Institute at West Point, thank you for joining us on this War Council. I am your moderator, Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Faint, and I'm pleased to be here with four outstanding panelists to discuss the withdrawal from Afghanistan, causes and consequences. For those of you joining us for the first time, traditionally a war council was a gathering of advisors and experts who come together to offer information, analysis, and advice. In this context, our council is not a prelude to or advocacy for war. Additionally, please keep your microphones muted. The only individuals speaking during today's events are the panelists and the moderators. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat window using the show conversation icon in the top right corner of your screen. And as always, the individuals here are operating in their own capacity and do not represent the official views of any other person or organization. And now, some introductions. Major Kyle Atwell is currently an active duty U.S. Army Special Forces officer serving as an instructor of international affairs in the Department of Social Sciences at the United States Military Academy at West Point. His operational experience includes over 20 months of combat in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2014 as an infantry officer, as well as assignments in North and West Africa, South Korea, and Germany. The majority of Major Atwell's military experience has focused on unconventional warfare, countering insurgencies, and building partner force capacity among U.S. allies and partners around the world. Kyle is also the founder and co-director of the Irregular Warfare Initiative, a joint venture between the Modern War Institute at West Point and Princeton's Empirical Studies of Conflict Project. He holds BA degrees in Economics and International Relations from the University of California at Davis and a MA in Public Affairs from Princeton University. He is currently a PhD candidate with a focus in security studies at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Thank you for joining us today, Major Atwell. Dr. Paul D. Miller is a professor of the practice of international affairs at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. He serves as co-chair of the Global Politics and Security Concentration in the MSFS program. He is also a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. As a practitioner, Dr. Miller served as director for Afghanistan and Pakistan on the National Security Council staff, worked as an intelligence analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency, and served as a military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. He holds a Ph.D. in international relations and a B.A. in government from Georgetown University, as well as a master in public policy from Harvard University. Good to see you again, Dr. Miller. Dr. Jonathan Schroden is the director of CNA's Countering Threats and Challenges program, whose mission is to support U.S. government efforts to better understand and counter state and non-state threats and challenges. He also directs CNA's Special Operations Program, which focuses on bringing CNA's full-spectrum research and analysis capabilities to bear on the most complex and challenging issues facing Special Operations Forces today and in the future. Dr. Schroden has been with CNA since 2003, during which time he has deployed or traveled 13 times to Afghanistan and twice to Al Anbar, Iraq. He also traveled throughout the Middle East, gotten underway with numerous Navy ships, and supported Hurricane Katrina disaster relief operations. He holds PhD and MS degrees from Cornell University and BS degrees from the University of Minnesota Duluth. He has published in numerous written outlets and is also a frequent commentator in television and in print. Dr. Schroden, welcome to the panel. Dr. Rachel Tico is an assistant professor in the Strategic and Operational Research Department at the U.S. Naval War College. Her research focuses on U.S. military strategy and operations, alliance and partnership dynamics, and civil military relations. Her current book project examines U.S. efforts to build militaries and partner states. Dr. Ticote holds a, holds a PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she was a member of the Security Studies Program. She is an adjunct fellow with the Center for a New American Security Defense Program, and her research has appeared in numerous publications. Dr. Ticote, we are very grateful for your time. Panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. As we previously discussed, each of you will now have up to six minutes to provide opening comments, and we will then move on to structured Q&A, followed by questions from the audience. Kyle, we'll start with you. Hey, thank you, sir. Can you guys hear me okay? Good to go, Kyle. All right. Um, so I'm excited to join such an outstanding panel of individuals, and I'm truly humbled to be here. Like These are the types of guests I would be asking to come on the Irregular Warfare podcast and to write articles for the Irregular Warfare Initiative, 
which is exactly what we did with Rachel Teacott recently, her, her article published last week. Um, so it's just truly incredible lineup you pulled together, sir. And the timing could not be more perfect. This is exactly the conversation that we need to have right now. So both in the classroom at West Point where I'm teaching cadets in the social science department, but also in the hallways at West Point, it's clear that people are trying to understand what happened in Afghanistan. And as I thought about this event the last couple of days, I realized there are kind of two hats I can wear to reflect on Afghanistan. I can put on my practitioner hat as a recovering infantry officer who spent probably too much of my early career focused on Afghanistan, or I could put on my academic hat as a PhD candidate who currently one of my case studies is looking at U.S. operations in Afghanistan as well as other places. And I think, uh, you know, given the audience, both are probably appropriate. Um, so putting on my practitioner hat, from this perspective, I'm a mid-career Army officer whose formative years were defined by war in Afghanistan. Uh, I remember in 2009 in the Basic Officer Leaders course, which is essentially even before you go to infantry school, um, I was guarding some tower in the woods of a made-up outpost in the middle of Georgia and Fort Benning, and I went into the operations center, and everybody was uh, surrounding a TV there. And what was happening was President Obama was giving a now-famous speech at West Point announcing a surge of troops in Afghanistan. And we all knew exactly what that meant. We were all going to deploy to Afghanistan, which is exactly what happened. So I spent about 20 months as an infantry platoon leader and then a company XO in Afghanistan, uh, leading men through my first firefights, uh, losing soldiers, missing the birth of my first son, William, who's now seven years old. And I was promoted to both first lieutenant and captain in Afghanistan, just to give you the context for how this dominated both my early career and that of many of my peers. And of course, Many motivated infantry officers that I knew would have had it no other way. Combat in Afghanistan was the combat arms officer's dream. Combat was what we joined for, it's what we trained for, and this was the big game. So now I don't, I don't claim to be anywhere near qualified to speak on behalf of my generation of Army officers, but I'm happy to share with the cadet audience and others um, what I am reflecting on personally as we did the withdrawal from Afghanistan. My hope is that this helps drive dialogue forward. I definitely don't claim to have all the answers. So some of the big questions that I'm hearing in the classroom and in the hallways with my friends and peers is what went wrong? How did all of this sacrifice and hard work, the sleepless months and years away from home committed to a mission at all costs that we would ultimately lose happen? And there's no question in at least my mind and the minds of many of my peers that we definitely lost in Afghanistan. Was this whole thing a waste? And, you know, at a time when people are quick to identify the things that did go wrong, which is important, there are probably other things that went right in the last years, last 20 years of blood, sweat, and sacrifice. So they say doctrine is written in blood, and these are hard-earned lessons which we should not squander. I suggest that to carry on the lessons from Afghanistan, which we paid so dearly for, we should carry forward both the good and the bad. And I would be remiss to not mention one last question that's, that's prominent among my peers and in the national media Simmering in the background at this very emotional time for those who served is who is to blame for it going wrong. However cathartic pointing fingers might feel, I would suggest it is only as valuable as there are lessons learned for future wars we can derive from that answer. So these are kind of the emotions and questions that I'm personally going through as an officer, that my wife is going through as a military officer and many of my peers, I suspect. Um, I would encourage cadets in the classroom to have these conversations with your instructors and TAC officers and others who have served in your life. It is better to learn from the past than to hide from it, I think. And uh, these people have experiences they'll be eager to share with you. And so now I can kind of put on my, my academic hat. I believe we must study and learn from the successes and failures of our war in Afghanistan. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our soldiers who have lost their lives. And we owe it to you and the next generation who will certainly be presented with similar challenges in the future. And for me, you know, spending the last uh, 10 years in Afghanistan, there's three kind of big lessons that, that I have personally observed that were anecdotal, but I'm trying to use research to see if they were more systematic across Afghanistan and across other cases of U.S. intervention. If so, it means it's not just my personal experiences, but this is a systematic failure in how the U.S. conducts these wars. The first is that the U.S. is not good at partner warfare. We're not good at working by, with, and through others to accomplish our security objectives. The guidance for me when I deployed in 2010 was very clearly to work by, with, and through my partners. It was written down and it was, in, it was uh, promulgated through things like minimum partner force ratios on patrols. You had to bring Afghans on patrol. But what, it actually, let, what actually happened on the ground was um, U.S. troops kind of grabbing a couple of Afghans on the way out the door, not wanting to work with them. And the best way I've heard it described is that when you deploy to Afghanistan as an infantry officer or a combat arms officer or any officer, it's like going to the Super Bowl. 
when you make it to the Super Bowl, which you've trained your whole career for, you don't want to sit on the sidelines while your partner does the fight. But the bottom line is, despite strategic guidance to work by with and through, we did not do it. The second observation is that when we flooded troops into areas, we could at best bring short-term stability sometimes, but we could not let that make that stability last after we left. Left. I saw this in the valleys that we would surge troops in in Wardak province in 2010 and 2011. As soon as we left, we saw the Taliban move in, do propaganda videos showing them moving in, and things reverted to the ex-anti status quo. I think we saw this broader in Helmand province, where I was not, where, where I was not located, where Marines were able to bring a modicum of stability for a while, but as soon as they withdrew, Helmand fell again to the Taliban. And I think we see recently with Afghanistan that this was the case. The U.S. forces could bring some stability in the short term, but we could not bring long term. Understanding why this happened is extremely important. Um, and uh, I realize I'm at the six minute mark, so I'll stop uh, babbling on. I had other points to say, but I, again, I appreciate you having me here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hey, thanks, Kyle. That was an excellent way to start us off. Thank you for that, ex that excellent opening. Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, and thank you to, uh, for the invitation to speak here and to all those who are listening. My video is pretty choppy, so I hope my audio is coming through okay. Just let me know if it's not. Uh, the topic here is causes and consequences of the withdrawal. The causes, uh, the cause of the withdrawal was U.S. policy decision. Uh, the United States government under several administrations made a series of policy choices that resulted in not just the fact of withdrawal, but the way the withdrawal happened over the last few months. I'd point to four specific um, uh, decisions, uh, all the way back to President Bush's light footprint, which I think enabled a security vacuum into which the Taliban were able to step, President Obama's withdrawal timetables, President Trump's peace deal, and then, of course, President Biden's decision to complete that deal and complete the pullout. I think those four decisions are what ultimately led to what we've witnessed over the past month. Uh, each could have gone differently, and each would have led to a different result. I would stress that the way the withdrawal happened and the fact of the withdrawal was not inevitable. I think we've heard that line, <clears throat> both from the administration and others, saying that this was going to happen sooner or later. That, I think, it feels to me as an effort to evade accountability for what has happened. Because if it was inevitable, then we were powerless and we can't be held responsible for it. And I don't buy that. I think this was very much not inevitable. Um, <clears throat> the war, uh, in my uh, research, uh, looks to me to be fairly sustainable in the sort of 2014 to 2020 uh, phase. Uh, I'm not saying it was a stalemate. I know, Jonathan, I see you shaking your head. We've disagreed with, uh, about this over Twitter. I'm not saying it was a stalemate. I'm not saying, and it's true, the Taliban were making some gains in the battlefield. But I observe even in 2014, when the United States had 30,000 troops in country, that's when the Taliban were not making gains. And the United States only took 55 casualties that year. That seems to me militarily sustainable, low cost, low risk, few troops in harm's way. The US was not engaged in ground combat in large numbers. There was no large domestic anti-war movement. Uh, and the war in that phase was not what we saw this spring. I have, I have criticisms of the war as it was waged in those years. It was not an optimal strategy at all, but it was better than what we just saw in the last month. It was better than what we saw this spring with the uh, precipitous withdrawal. Uh, and, and you're going to hear the other view from Jonathan in a bit, and I look forward to hearing it. The consequence of the withdrawal is clear. It's a humanitarian catastrophe. It's a, a markedly higher counter, uh, terrorism risk, uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, it is an international public humiliation, and it's a loss of a tempo to our geopolitical rivals. I want to be clear what I mean there. I don't think that China or Russia is going to swoop in and steal this box on the global checkerboard. That's not quite what it means. What I mean is that um, we've obviously suffered a setback in our efforts to uh, sort of sell our vision of the world. Uh, that gives it space for others, for China and for Russia, to sell their vision of the world. If you play chess, you know that you can gauge who's controlling the game, who's setting the agenda. Plainly, that's not us right now. And I think the fall of Kabul is one small part of that. So that is part of the consequences of the withdrawal as we've seen it. My lessons from all this <clears throat> is number one, surge from day one. 
if you're going to intervene militarily, don't start small and gradually build up year after year. I think that that is a sort of a frog in the hot plate scenario. If you're going to do an intervention of any kind, we I think we see this in both Iraq and Afghanistan, kind of got to go in all in on day one. Uh, number two, do not try to fight wars on timelines. Uh, I did a long study comparing Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam, and I came to the um, not very surprising conclusion that timelines um, undermine military progress, they undermine diplomatic leverage, they do not accomplish the things that presidents think they will accomplish, but they do incur the costs we all know they will incur. People say, well, we can't stay there forever. And I just wanna turn that around and say, we can't fight wars on timelines. There's not a single uh, book of strategy, there's not a single military field manual that says fighting wars on timelines is a good idea. So next time there's a war and you hear somebody talk about timelines, you need to understand that they are talking about a timeline for how to lose that war. Similarly, I guess point number three is um, this language about ending wars is language about losing wars. We win wars or we lose wars. We don't really just end them. You can't walk away uh, without a, a result of that war, either confirming or denying your interest for which you were fighting. So as soon as you hear people using this language about ending wars, understand that they are saying losing wars. That's what it means. Search from day one, don't talk about timelines and stop all talk about ending wars uh, unless you are gonna give up on victory. Those are my lessons and uh, thank you very much. That's great, Paul, thank you. John, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I really appreciate the chance to, to join such an esteemed panel and this audience. It, this is a great discussion I've been looking forward to all week. Um, so most of my work is focused on the Afghan National Security Forces, and, and I've gotten a lot of questions, as you might imagine, as to what happened with them, right? Why did they collapse? How did that happen? So I thought I'd give a few uh, comments to that regard, and I'm happy to, to answer questions beyond the, the, my remarks uh, when we get to that point. I will, you know, I was laughing when Paul uh, called me out there. Yes, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything he just said, and that's fine. Uh, we can get into that in the Q&A as well. I will, however, start with a point on which I think he and I would agree, which is we have never had anything, uh, any semblance of what I would call strategic coherence in Afghanistan. And when it comes to the ANDSF, <clears throat> excuse me, I would go right back to the beginning and say, if you look at the immediate aftermath of the U.S. invasion in 2001, there was a period of three to four years where the country was relatively calm, relatively peaceful. The insurgency had been mostly dashed and scattered to the wind. Uh, and the U.S. had a real chance to build a security force that could you know, bring us a modicum of stability inside the country. Uh, and it failed to do that, right? And so why did it fail to do that? Well, one, there was this what I call original sin between uh, President Bush at that time and his Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld. So Bush, if you go back and read the histories of this time, as I have uh, of late, right, Bush would, would never say that he was interested in nation building, certainly would never use that term, but had this belief that we should leave Afghanistan better than we found it. He felt this responsibility to do that. Uh, and so he, he allowed, he tolerated various forms of nation building like activities to proceed. His Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, wanted to simply get the hell out of Afghanistan as fast as he possibly could. Those are vastly distinct strategic views of, of what the U.S. military should be doing there. And, and they were translated directly into incoherence when it came to developing the Afghan army and Af Afghan security forces. So it comes back to Paul's point as well. We started too small, right? We tried to build an army that wasn't big enough, didn't have the right capabilities at the outset. Uh, and by the time we get to 2006 and the Taliban insurgency has regrouped, has resurged into Afghanistan, is now causing all kinds of you know, violence and, and uh, havoc across, especially the south of the country, we find ourselves in react mode. The Afghan security forces are unable to uh, respond to that insurgency, uh, even with U.S. support, and they need to be expanded. And so the U.S. then embarks on a deliberate set of uh, decisions to uh, prioritize quantity over quality to get as many trigger pullers into the field as quickly as we possibly could to deal with this now burgeoning insurgency. So quantity over quality. And because they never really caught up with it until the sort of, you know, heyday of the surge, 
they were also prioritizing operational expediency over sustainability, right? And so trying to get as much military equipment, high-end stuff to the force to try and build them up as much as we possibly could, as quickly as we possibly could, and we would worry about logistics and sustainability and maintenance, et cetera, later. And then the third thing that we did in that time frame is we mirror imaged the whole thing. So the Afghan army, right, we tried to make look like a miniature version of the U.S. Army. We militarized their police force because we didn't have a, you know, a, a police training entity large enough to train them in domestic policing. So we assigned that role to the Department <coughs> of Defense as well who then turned the police force into a, basically a, a paramilitary. If you looked at the Ministry of Defense, for example, it looks shockingly like the office of the Secretary of Defense. So there was a huge amount of mirror imaging that took place as well. Uh, and as part of that, you know, below the category of mirror imaging, we failed to take into account things like the level of human capital that was available. And here I mean no disrespect to Afghans at all, but it is an extremely poor, agrarian, highly illiterate, highly innumerate country. Uh, and when you're starting from that level of human capital, you cannot expect that they're going to have lots of people who can, for example, use a internet-based logistics system that was designed by you know, Western contractors uh, and is com you know, almost completely in English. Um, so, right, that was uh, one thing we ran into. And then there was a lack of professionalization over time. Right. We didn't create the institutional capacity to build leaders at scale. There was continuously a 25 to 35 percent attrition rate year in and year out uh, of the army and the police force. So you know, every single year, a third of the force was turning over. You could never really get beyond that basic level of human capital. And yet we continued to shove more high end capability into the force because that's how we felt we were going to build overmatch capability. So you take those three major things together, quantity over quality, operational expediency over sustainability and mirror imaging, and you end up with a force that looks great on paper, right? It's a great talking point to say that it's a force of 300,000 soldiers and police who have all these helicopters and thousands of up-armored vehicles and the, the latest and greatest Western-made weapons, right? And as soon as they're tested, without U.S. air support, without U.S. logistics support, without U.S. strategic backing, what happens? They fell apart. And we saw the same thing happen in Iraq. And if you go back to Vietnam, you can find, you know, echoes of the same thing happening in Vietnam. So I just point to those three, you know, things. Uh, when people ask me what happened with ANDSF, there are lots of things you could point to, but I settle on our deliberate decisions to focus on quantity over quality, operational expediency over sustainability, and mirror imaging as those things that effectively doomed the Afghan security forces to be effective on their own. Great, thank you, John. Rachel? All right, um, well, thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. It's really great to join my fellow panelists and all of you today. Uh, and before I get started, I just have to say that the perspective I'm gonna share today is mine. I'm not representing the views of the Naval War College, the Navy, the DOD, or the US government. Um, so I'm going to focus on one part of the story of the US war in Afghanistan, and that's the story of the US effort to build Afghan national security forces. This is Kyle's point one and Jonathan's discussion as well. Um, so a central pillar of US strategy in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq and Vietnam before that, was building competent, capable government security forces that could take over responsibility for securing the country from the US when the US withdrew. But despite spending billions of dollars and decades building government security forces, as we all saw, uh, these forces melted away to the Taliban in a few short weeks. So not unlike the Iraqi security forces in June 2014 in Mosul or the Army of the Republic uh, of Vietnam in Saigon in 75. So what's going on here? What happened to the Afghan national security forces and why does the US struggle to build better militaries and partner states? So I'm gonna offer another perspective on, on this problem. So in five minutes, I'm gonna make three quick points and two suggestions for future advisory efforts. So point one, Building effective partner militaries is hard because partner leaders often have other priorities. So as you all know, military effectiveness doesn't just depend on how big a military is or how much cash it has or what kind of hardware it's got. The US made sure that the Afghan National Army was big, had a lot of cash and had a lot of hardware. Military effectiveness depends on people and to a large extent on patterns of decisions that people make around critical issues such as personnel, 
command structures, training, and corruption. So a fundamental barrier to building the ANSF was that Afghan political leaders and military officers, many of them, not all of them, had priorities that competed directly with the goal of building a professional national army. And many, not all, were inclined to take the assistance that the U.S. gave them while simultaneously implementing policies that ensured that their military stayed weak. For instance, siphoning off U.S. dollars to enrich cronies and shaking down the local population uh, at every interaction. So this brings me to point two. To deal with this fundamental motivation problem, the U.S. military relies on personal diplomacy to try to reshape partner thinking and behavior, and it doesn't work. So the U.S. military is not blind to the fact that recipients of its military assistance are often implementing policies that are undermining the whole mission. So the U.S. military advisors tasked with influencing Afghan leaders saw firsthand every day how corruption was rotting the Afghan security forces to the core. And the U.S. military developed doctrine focused on standard operating procedures precisely designed to influence uncooperative partners um, to guide its advisors in dealing with this problem. So that doctrine is rapport-based persuasion. So advisors are taught to build trust and rapport with the leaders of partner militaries and then to leverage those personal relationships to coax and cajole and convince partner officers to curb corruption, promote merit meritocratically, abide by the chain of command, otherwise take steps to strengthen their militaries. Advisors are also taught to try to inspire partner officers to follow their advice. That's the show them what right looks like mantra. Um, and in contrast, advisors are actively discouraged from using carrots and sticks to incentivize partner leaders to follow their advice. So I'm just going to say that one more time. The U.S. provides a ton of cash and equipment and other things to the partner military, and the advisors are taught not to make those carrots conditional on partners actually using them to improve the military. So this, this preference for persuasion and aversion to conditionality has, in my estimation, evolved from a U.S. military doctrine of advising into ideology. So this is an ideology complete with normative beliefs that conditionality equals bullying and causal myths like the U.S. lacks bargaining power or that interpersonal rapport is enough on its own to get this really difficult job done. Um, so rapport-based persuasion is kind of simply put bad doctrine. U.S. advisors often do manage to build trust and friendship with partner leaders, um, but these friendships do not usually move those same partners to take steps that compete with their priorities. So in the past, when advisors have supplemented personal diplomacy with conditional carrots and sticks, the results have been a bit better. Um, okay, third point. This is a military innovation problem. Among other problems, this is a military innovation problem. So the U.S. military is stuck on a strategy of advising that doesn't work. There are a lot of factors that make it difficult for militaries or any large bureaucracies, for that matter, to innovate. So in the case of advisory missions, the U.S. military has institutionalized standard operating procedures that are more geared towards sustaining the complicated machinery of advising more than the, that the machinery is actually connected to the goal. So advisory efforts are geared towards making the trains run on time rather than making sure that the trains are running in the right direction. So the, the collapse of the ANSF was not a surprise to those involved in the advisory project, though the speed was a surprise. So for years and years, U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan saw and understood that the ANSF could not stand on its own. But bureaucracy did its thing, and the U.S. military stuck with its SOPs, which included presenting overly optimistic reports of progress to a Washington that was also plenty eager for happy talk. So what's next for U.S. military assistance? Beyond Afghanistan, this is very much a live problem. The U.S. military continues to train, advise, and assist the Iraqi security forces, and U.S. military personnel are deployed right now all over the world on advise and assist, buy with and through, train and equip missions. And just a few years ago, the Army institutionalized the security force assistance brigades. So I'll close with two broad suggestions for the U.S. military with respect to building partner militaries in the future. The first is lower the ambitions. It is beyond the competency of the U.S. military to build national armies and stateless nations at war, and it shouldn't keep trying. It is within the competency of the U.S. military, however, to build effective elite units that operate with American enablers. The second suggestion is to change the doctrine. Advisors cannot rely on personal diplomacy alone to move partner leaders to build better militaries or military units. Incentives do help. Uh, so I'll end there, and now I'll really look forward to hearing from all of you. Panelists, thank you so much for that very insightful opening commentary. That was fab That was fabulous. So I now have some structured questions to get the Q&A going, and I'll add additional questions from the audience. So as a reminder, audience members, please feel free to add potential questions in the chat. 
So before we get into some of these these Q and A questions, Kyle, I think that you had one more point you wanted to make, but ran out of time, and we're actually uh, a little bit ahead right now, which is the first time I've ever moderated a panel that that stayed on time, which is fantastic. So thank you for that, panelists. So Kyle, if you'd like to make your last point before we get into questions, you can go ahead and do that now. Yeah, thank you, sir. I mean, actually, my last point builds right off of um, what Paul was talking about, and I would tepidly push back on his argument that we should surge from day one. Um, and the, wh why I would do so is I would ask, when has a surge led to long-term long -term stability in a case like this once we left? Uh, I think the best case is Iraq, which people argue the surge worked, but as soon as U.S. troops withdrew within two years, the Islamic State was essentially routing the Iraqi security forces. So I'm not sure there's cases where a surge from day one would have worked. And in Vietnam, we had over 550,000 troops, five times the number of troops we had in Afghanistan, and it did not work. So how are we going to say that the surge would work? Um, I think that surges are politically unstable, which is why you have timelines. And I think for us, we cannot design strategies that ignore politics. For us to say if we just had more willpower to endure these surges without timelines is essentially us denying the nature of U.S. domestic politics. And I think that's going to lead to failure in strategy. Um, kind of moving on uh, to, to my main point is that um, I argue that we're not good at partner warfare because we try to make the fight about ourselves. We make ourselves a center of fight by saying if we had more, we could do this. Um, I would argue that we can solve these problems without more U.S. forces by building more sustainable approaches that are locally, contextually relevant. And they can actually last both while we're there because of domestic U.S. politics. We're not being called to pull them out. And they would also last uh, once we leave because, uh, uh, um, for example, Afghan security forces can maintain these. Um, so to, to give one statistic that was kind of hinted at, but the, there were about 2,300 U.S. casualties that were killed in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2021. Of those 2,300, 2,200 happened between October of 2001 and 2014. Less than 100, 100 happened from 2014 to 2021. So that's a pretty remarkable change. And the big you know, correlation with U.S. troop presence was we had a surge that occurred. When we had massive U.S. casualties that drove a kind of call for withdrawals in U.S. domestic politics. Once the surge drew down in 2014, we were able to have a more sustainable approach to Afghanistan. And kind of my, my, my last point on this is that um, Well, I, I think I'll stop there. I, I think I kind of presented enough information, but I, I would say that our inability to kind of put the Afghans first and design strategies where we don't steal the fight from them, our inability to do partner warfare effectively by making ourselves the center of the fight is one of the causes that we end up with these unsustainable security structures that revert to ex-ante security status where the Taliban takes over when we leave because it was depending on our presence. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Kyle. So, Paul, I'm going to direct this question to you, but it's it's open for any of the panelists to answer after you have a shot at it. But in considering the coming age of multipolarity and a return to great power competition, what opportunities and threats does China see in Afghanistan? Well, I think China sees Afghanistan as a possible addition to its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, kind of wrap Afghanistan into that broader network and tie it down in a debt trap like it has other countries. It won't be, look, Afghanistan is not that important um, economically. And so whether China does that or not is not a huge deal for us. It's a huge deal for the Afghans, of course. Um, threats, you know, they talk about the, the threats from the, uh, the alleged threat from the Uyghurs and the Uyghur militants. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll trump that up as much as they want to for their own purposes. Again, I want to kind of return to the point I made in my opening remarks. To the extent that this matters for great power competition, it's less about who gets to control the great game in Central Asia and more about how this event um, reveals the underlying uh, ebbs and flows of, of who has the initiative, who, who is setting the global agenda, who is, uh, um, uh, who's on the back foot, as we, I think, plainly are right now. That's what I'm more concerned about than what China will do in Afghanistan. Excellent, thank you for that. Other panelists, do you have some thoughts on that as well? What opportunities and threats China sees in Afghanistan as a result of the US withdrawal? Okay, 
nothing heard, we'll go ahead and move on then. So Kyle, this next one is for you. How would you respond to people who say that our over the horizon targeting and our non-kinetic options are sufficient to prevent another 9-11 from emanating from Afghanistan? Sir, I just want to start. Are you picking on me right now? Because I'm kind of the junior guy here. Um, <laughs> uh, but but that that that's fine. You know, um, I, I think that you lose something when you remove a footprint on the ground, which is you remove the ability to kind of monitor how your efforts are actually performing. Now, I think there'll be a lot of people who argue that you know what you lose is really an intelligence picture of what it is you're striking with drone strikes. Because when you rely on highly technical capabilities, when you rely on signals, intelligence, and uh, <laughs> eyes in the sky to kind of figure out where the enemy is, you don't exactly know what it is you're striking because you don't have the ground feedback. But I would also argue that, that I, think, I think Rachel is right in that one of our key objectives in these areas is not just to mow the lawn today from terrorists, but it's to build a more sustainable indigenous force that can manage these threats in coordination or in alliance with our own security interests in the long term. And to do that, you cannot do that without troops on the ground who are working with and monitoring the activities that are happening. So you can influence the partner force. I think what Rachel is bringing a good point to is we haven't quite figured out how to influence the partner force to reform and become more effective. Although I would argue there are cases in U.S. history where we've worked with partner forces and been able to facilitate some reform in their effectiveness, in their human rights records, and in these other areas. But it hasn't been universally successful. And identifying where it's been successful and where it has not been successful should be one of our key goals. But the bottom line is, if you're just mowing the lawn from abroad, you're not going to change long term what's going to happen. You're probably setting up a kind of permanent situation where you always have to be doing over the horizon counterterrorism. Thank you for that, Kyle. Any responses or additional comments on that question from the other panelists? Well, uh, to, to Kyle's point, it's important to figure out where this went better to be able to identify some lessons for, you know, how do we do this right? Did Have we done this right anywhere else? That goes to a question that came up in the in the chat about um, in other places, have, has the U.S. used carrots and sticks to, to get this job done? And so I could I could flag to a few of those where uh, combining kind of the personal diplomacy approach with a, its systematic incentive structures was pretty helpful to, to actually achieve this influence. That's really, to me, the long, the long pole in the tent when it comes to advising. Everything else follows from that. Everything, if, if you can't influence the partner leaders to be taking the steps that we all know are crucial for the development of the military, then almost nothing else matters. And so uh, in, in those cases, for instance, in, in Korea, the U.S. 8th Army and the, the KMAG built a pretty effective Republic of Korea Army in just a few short years. That's not an analogous case. No cases are ever analogous cases, but that was a pretty different case, of course. Um, but in, in that particular case, the general officers, General Van Fleet, for instance, were very, um, they built personal rapport with, with the president. They built personal rapport, but they also systematically used threat to sever assistance, both at the that, that the top national level, but also down to the tactical level of the KMAG advisors um, to to sort of incentivize military officers at the ground level to follow U.S. direction, and that case went much better. But it isn't just Korea, which of course has so many differences. Uh, in Iraq, General Petraeus and General Dubik, for instance, during the surge, uh, used kind of the cessation of particular logistical support items to uh, to incentivize um, PM Maliki to take some steps to get rid of some of the most notorious uh, commanders in, in the national police. Um, and also General Petraeus did this, used a threat to sever assistance to a particular uh, elite unit within the Iraqi security forces in 2004 to disincentivize then PM um, Alawi from taking steps to, um, to politicize that particular elite unit. And so uh, I do think that there is a, a fair amount of precedent for combining, not to get rid of personal rapport and diplomacy, I think that's an important part of it, um, but not to stick with that and not to say, if we build interpersonal relationships, we've done the job. That's one tool in a toolkit, and other tools do include uh, taking making the assistance uh, in certain ways conditional. It's not the blunt blunt instrument of you sever all assistance or you continue all assistance. That's a threat that's difficult to make credible. But there are much finer tuned carrots and sticks that you can manipulate on a more systematic basis uh, throughout an advisory effort. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hey. Rachel, I'm going to follow up with that based on a, a question from the chat. And again, any panelist is free to, to chime in after Rachel. So does the institutionalization of the advisory role in the Security Forces Assistance Brigades or SFABs 
mark a continuation or an evolution of the U.S. Army's doctrinal thinking and, on advising? Continuation. Uh, I I went and did the uh, the training for the advisors in the in the SVABs. And if you if you navigate right now, if you Google the reading the the MADA, the military advisor training uh, assistance, I forget the uh, the the acronym. But if you go to that website and you look at the uh, the suggested readings um, on the syllabus, they are Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Stuart Di Stuart Diamond, Dale Carnegie. It's um, how do you build rapport? How do you befriend? Um, and so it seems to me from the curriculum of the of the SVABs that it's a doubling down and a further institutionalization of relationships are the core and the only tool of influence in advising. And there's continued discouragement of, um, of a transactional approach or a bullying approach, um, because those are tactics that our enemies use, our adversaries and competitors use those tactics. Um, and, it's, and I think it's really um, kind of an Amer a manifestation of an American foreign policy that likes to view itself as a beacon and ins it inspires people to follow its guidance. It doesn't push them to um, by demonstrating our example, by using our argumentative skills and our logic, uh, partners will will come around to our way of doing things. And in reality, in places like Afghanistan, that's that's just often not the case. Um, so to on, on that point, I, I think that what the SVABs do are address a lot of the, um, the bureaucratic hurdles in advising and creating kind of a, a system for bringing for setting SOPs up um, and sustaining them uh, with a bit more ease but it just you know it's it further indoctrinates and entrenches this relationships and rapport approach so so yeah I would definitely come down on continuation very good very good hey John I'm going to direct this next question to you but I'd like each panelist to answer it should the U.S. recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan? Well, that's a very good question, um, and I will give a calibrated answer to that, right? I don't think there is a hard and fast answer to that. Really, the question is going to be, what did the Taliban do over the next, you know, few weeks to months, and how does that compare to U.S. interests, uh, right? So. You know, and, and this is an area where it's been interesting to watch President Biden's speeches relative to the various constituencies that he has. Right? President Biden has been steadfast that the U.S. has one overarching vital national interest in Afghanistan, and that is countering terrorism, right? which is an interesting statement to make for an administration that said going in that human rights were going to be at the center of their foreign policy approach. So that, that's an interesting dichotomy that's going to play out. Um, and the president has a lot of constituencies that are very focused on human rights and especially women's rights in Afghanistan. And the Taliban is unlikely to have a very good record on those. But that said, coming back to the earlier question about over the horizon CT. So the over the horizon CT uh, approach for Afghanistan was predicated on sort of two major assumptions. One is that the government would hold and that we would maintain a partner force on the ground in Afghanistan, at least in the form of the Afghan commandos and the special mission wing. That was one assumption. The second is that you would be able to generate intelligence from inside the country, either through that partner force, or you know, it's possible that through the embassy, you could run intelligence operations out of there. Uh, and so those were two assumptions that underpinned the over the horizon CT approach that we were gonna use. Neither of those assumptions is true anymore. And so the U.S., when it comes to CT in Afghanistan, is going to have to pick, a, you know, pick from a, a small menu of possible alternatives. One is they could continue to do unilateral over the horizon CT, where we effectively fly drones all the way from bases in the Middle East, presumably over Pakistan, and have them loiter over various areas that we care about in Afghanistan. Right. And we do that continuously. That is technically feasible. The U.S. could do that. It's hugely costly from a resource and dollar perspective. The other thing the U.S. could do is it could try to identify a new partner force on the ground. And this is what you're hearing calls right now from you know various constituencies for the U.S. to support the National Resistance Force and Panjshir, both you know from a socket to the Taliban perspective, but also, hey, this might be a partner force with which we could work on CT going forward. The other calls that you're you're likely to hear, or at least to hear broached, uh, and I was asked to write a paper by War on the Rocks on this, which I hope to have in there next week, which is should the U.S. partner with the Taliban in terms of countering at least the Islamic State, 
in Afghanistan, which is a common enemy that we both share. And this is an interesting dynamic because what most people don't recognize is the U.S. has already partnered with or at least cooperated with uh, the Taliban against the Islamic State as as recently as a couple of years ago or within the last year and a half, uh, dropping bombs on the Islamic State to at least tacitly support Taliban offenses against them. Uh, clearly, we've had uh, very close cooperation with the Taliban over the last couple of weeks in, in the course of the evacuation. And it was fascinating to see the terms that General McKenzie, uh, the CENTCOM commander, the very measured tones that he used when talking about that, giving t the Taliban credit for having foiled several potential attacks against the airport, et cetera. And then to see General Milley's comment just a couple of, of days ago uh, when asked point blank, will the U.S. Uh, cooperate with the Taliban going forward? And his response was, it's possible. So I think we're in an era where that is one of a slate of options that the administration uh, you know, might consider and I think should consider. And it, it pains me to say that these are odd times in which we live. Uh, but we do, you know, the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. We're never going to be friends with the Taliban, but it's worth recognizing we do have a common enemy in the form of the Islamic State. Nice. Thank you, John. Paul, same question. What are your thoughts about U.S. recognition of the Taliban? So I think I largely agree. Uh, I would say not yet. There's certainly no reason to do so right now. It seems to me that the Taliban right now are eager to avoid the same kind of international isolation that they had in the 1990s. Uh, they don't want the same pariah status, although it may be inevitable. That means we have just a smidge of leverage here. Uh, they would like to be recognized. We would like to complete the evacuation of our Afghan allies. And we would like to have, I think, some kind of assurances about uh, denying safe haven to terrorists. That means we shouldn't recognize them yet. I would love to see us dangle that in front of the Taliban uh, to compel them to cooperate with further evacuations. Um, I, I rather like the idea of us partnering with the Panjiris, dumping about a, a bunch of cash and weapons on them not to help them win the war, but rather uh, help them be an intelligence asset for us and a CT asset for us. Uh, that might, uh, you know, that might make it impossible for us to recognize the Taliban, and that's okay with me. So again, I think we can dangle it in front of the Taliban for now as leverage, but I'm not sure we ever have to act on it. Excellent, thank you, Rachel. What are your thoughts? Um, I. I largely agree with with Paul in the sense I, I don't I don't think that there's any immediate um, any immediate need to recognize the the Taliban at this moment. It's something that um that uh, that could be that could be dangled as a lever to be potentially used later. Um, so I'll I'll leave it there. Excellent, Kyle. Any thoughts on this issue? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say that you know if the if the plan is to partner with the Panjshiris, this essentially takes us back to day one in two thousand one when our plan was to partner with the Panjiris, which we did with a great success, um, helping them through very small footprints and very large kind of enabling packages of airstrikes and intelligence to dislodge the Taliban. I guess I would ask is, if that's where the end state is, was all that surge of resources and efforts between day one and now really worth it? Or could we have maybe tailored a lighter footprint package from the beginning and just sustain that over time? recognizing that it doesn't accomplish some of our more ambitious goals. But as Rachel said, maybe we need to tone down our ambitions when it comes to our interventions to accomplish our security interests in places like this. Roger. And Kyle, I saw your message uh, earlier. You said you had a response for Rachel. Do you still want to make that point or do you want to move on? Yeah, I, I just can't, I can't help it because I love Rachel's line of research. Um, and for my cadets who are like listening right now and get extra credit if they critique one of these speakers, um, you can critique me. That's extra, extra credit and also too easy, though. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things is, is essentially what I understand Rachel to be arguing is that um, personal diplomacy, the unwillingness to impose conditionality because we want to maintain personal rapport is a cause of our inability to influence partners to change. So for my cadets, there's an independent variable, and a dependent variable there. Now go ahead and critique it. Um, so, so what I would say is um, I think she's absolutely right in some ways that um, from personal experience that we're unwilling to impose conditionality at the tactical level, at least, because that's where I can speak from. But I would say that she argues that it does not work. I would suggest that it does not work for some things, but it does work well for other things. And I think she kind of went to this later in her comments. 
why it doesn't work and when it does work, I think is important. So just as kind of my, my, my tactical level personal experience, I think that persuasion founded on building networks of relationships does matter in some instances. So if you're at a tactical level and you are a U.S. advisor living in a remote Afghan base or in a remote Nigerian base, and you're very survival and access to the operation center of your partner force hinges on good rapport, it certainly matters that you maintain that good rapport, maybe at the expense of some of the conditionality you might impose on people. As we know, there was a lot of green on blue casualties, which means Afghans attacked Americans. Um, and so rapport might be a counter to that. So it's just important as future second lieutenants and first lieutenants to understand why you would like pursue rapport. And the second thing is at the strategic, strategic level, I think there are incidences where these personal relationships do provide options to policymakers. The one that General Votel gives is that when we needed to go back into, into Iraq and then in Syria in 2014 to counter ISIS, it was personal relationships with the Kurds that facilitated that entry point and created an option for the United States to build a partner force that could counter Islamic State terrorists. But I would concur, and this is like, I'll kind of go through this kind of quick, but I had a personal example in one African country where we were providing intelligence to our partner forces, and they refused to follow the kind of guidance we gave them on how to use it so they use it effectively. And I got in a big debate with my uh, British counterpart who outranked me, um, if you know, if, if Brits can outrank Americans, that's another conversation. Um, and my argument was, hey, we need to cut off the intelligence until they start operating the way we need them to operate, because this is just a waste of our resources. And his argument was, if you cut it off, I won't have access to the general officer anymore in the African army. And therefore, we can't even have these conversations. That's just to frame the kind of challenges that you have. And really, the, the ultimate kind of solution is these, you can't prescribe in doctrine how to behave in these situations. It requires judgment. You need very, very talented individuals at the tactical and operational level who know when to apply pressure and who know when the access and they're very like survival because they're being put in themselves in danger matters more. And that, that's a difficult thing to do because there's not a you always can do conditionality in this instance type of blueprint for it. I don't think. Thank you for that, Kyle. And Rachel, I see that you wanted to offer a quick response before we move on to a different subject. Go ahead. Yeah, Kyle, these are all such great points on your maybe working backwards. Actually, on your last one, it, it you can't prescribe every tactical decision that an advisor is going to make. Of course not. I think what's interesting about current doctrine is it proscribes the conditionality almost in every case and says that for almost every case, it's exclusively this personal diplomacy that's available to you. Whereas to give to give a little bit more flexibility to the advisors at the tactical level would be to remove that prohibition prohibition and to encourage uh, advisors to perhaps use an escalation ladder to start maybe with rapport building and then to, to use their powers of persuasion. If that fails, then to see whether they had any tools in the tool get that toolkit that they thought they might be able to lever to achieve whatever their most important goal is in that moment. So to your first point, so not working backwards, going from back to front, your first point, it all hinges on goals. What are you trying to do? Uh, and SFA generally can serve a whole broad range of goals. One of those goals is building a professional competent army that can uh, that can manage without the United States in the long run. Another objective might, in the more proximate term might be to just gather intelligence. Uh, another objective might be to secure access. There are many different objectives that you could be trying with your buy with and through and train and equip to achieve in a given moment. So when I'm I'm focusing mostly on this major goal of trying to build a professional national army. And for that objective, I think often the partners, their, their motivations are too different and their, their interests are too opposed. And so to expect advisors deployed for short periods of time, though I don't think that is actually the limiting factor, to be able to argue their way to having a, a local leader completely change what matters to them, it's setting up the advisors with an, an impossible task. And really that is what building a military comes down to. It's they, they, the partner leaders have to make difficult decisions that advance the development of the military. And rapport has been, it's been very difficult for advisors to rapport build their way to shaping the, that particular set of decisions. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. I hope to, to keep chatting with you offline though after this, it's nice to, to meet you. So Kyle and Rachel, thank you for that very excellent back and forth. I appreciate that. So, Paul, I'm going to ask you this next one. It's a question that you wanted to raise about whether we need to temper our ambitions in foreign policy. Can you explain what you meant by that? Well, I think I heard a few of our panelists raise a kind of a similar idea. And I've heard the criticism quite a bit that, you know, the lesson we need to learn from Afghanistan is 
is to be more humble in our foreign policy, not to try to be so ambitious. That it was a problem for us to try to remake Afghanistan. Uh, you know, it was neo-imperial and so forth. Um, I've been uh, interviewing uh, officials for my own research, and the interesting thing I've heard from a lot of senior Bush administration officials is they they honestly felt they had no choice. Um, right after 9/11, they deposed the Taliban regime. And they just didn't feel like they had a choice. They couldn't walk away because it was pretty obvious to them that the Taliban would come right back or something even worse than the Taliban. So it wasn't hubris, arrogance, uh, ambition, uh, or, or imperialism that led the United States into Afghanistan or to stay in Afghanistan. Uh, it was compulsion. The strategic logic of the situation seems to leave the administration with no real choice. Um, that I think you can still quibble with their thinking but the right criticism would be, was their strategic thinking correct? It's, it's not a morality tale about hubris, arrogance, and, and humility. Uh, I, I've seen these think pieces about how we need to be more humble. I don't think that's the problem. I don't think the problem is hubris and the solution is humility. Uh, the, the problem is about a lack of strategic coherence and the solution is better strategy. John, I'll ask uh, you to see if you have any comment on that as well. Any Any response or supporting fires for Paul's comments about tempering our ambitions in foreign policy? Well, I think, I mean, uh, well, I, I I think there was a lot of hubris early on. I, I, anyone who would go back and read anything that Don Rumsfeld wrote or said at the time, I think you'd be hard pressed to conclude that he was not chock full of hubris. I think you're making a broader point beyond just him, though, Paul. So I'll, uh, I'll yeah, I won't respond more than that on that particular one. I, I mean, from my point of view, it's it's less, you know, should we should we engage in this type of nation building or should we not? I. I don't know that we need to be more humble about it all. I mean, if the U.S. would decide we're going to rebuild a country, the U.S. could do that, right? We have the capability to do it. We have the resources to do it if we really wanted to. The problem is we don't commit, right? We never committed to, to building Afghanistan as a nation. Uh, and, and, and we never did. The, the whole, I mean, the most telling example of that to me is something you'll hear H.R. McMaster say in, in literally every interview he does, which is you know, we fought a 20 year war, not as a 20 year war, but as a series of 21 year wars. OK, great. Fantastic talking point. Guess what? At the 10 year mark in Afghanistan, the talking point was we haven't fought a 10 year war. We fought 10 one year wars. So why did we continue to fight 10 more one year wars after we had already recognized that that's what we were doing? It's because we, we never committed to a long-term campaign to build Afghanistan into something that was sustainable. We never committed to that, not from day two, not day, you know, the whole way. We never committed. So to me, it's less about needing to be humble and say like, well, let's never do station, nation building again because the U.S. is incapable of doing that, right? We, we need to be more humble than that. I think it's more about what is our you know, defining to Paul's point, what is our interest up front? What is the strategy to accomplish that interest? Once we've identified that, what is the resource bill and can we afford to pay it? And once you've done that analysis, commit to it. Do the thing that you've said is in your interest to do and that is your strategy to do. And then the last point I'll make is we got to do a better job of assessing how we're doing against those strategies as we employ them. Because that is right, something I've spent the last 13 years working on in Afghanistan, and I'll tell you, that was a disaster. Uh, we are terrible at assessing progress uh, in honest and objective and transparent ways that aren't Pollyanna-ish, that aren't you know constantly saying that we're going to turn a corner when we're not even close to that. So that's the last thing I'll say on that. Thank you, John. And I, when I you're completely agree with everything there. We agree. When John, when you were talking, it reminded me of something that General Crystal would ask us on the ground in Afghanistan. What would you do differently if you had to stay here until the war was over? It's something I thought about when you were making that point. Thank you both for that that exchange. And Kyle, I want to address this one to you because it was asked by my friend uh, T.J. Min, who, like you and I and numerous others on this call, were, were teachers in the West Point Department of Social Sciences. So this one's for you, courtesy of T.J. What lesson did our near peer adversaries or our allies learn from our messy exit in Afghanistan? Do these events change the calculus for Taiwan? Starting with you, Kyle, and ask the other panelists to chime in as well. 
You know what? I am going to respectfully pass on that question because that is uh, probably beyond my capabilities to answer intelligently. Right on. Then I'll uh, ask it, it. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll put on my kind of professor hat and say, you know, what would it take to answer that question? If you were going to say, if you were trying to test the argument that withdrawal from Afghanistan is something that you know that that has a negative um, a negative effect on the credibility of our commitment to Taiwan, you know, what evidence would you need to have to support that that assertion? So you would probably need, you know, ideally, if you were omniscient and could see everywhere, you'd want to get in the minds of Taiwanese leaders and of Xi Jinping. You would need to you would need to see how do they view what you're doing in Afghanistan in terms of um, you know the, the in terms of your commitment to Taiwan. So absent that insight into their brains, we often hinge on logic. So what, what's what's the logical conclusion that leaders in Taiwan and leaders in, in China would would come to, um, you know, from our withdrawal from Afghanistan? And you can outline two very distinct logical arguments that are directly competing with each other. So the one one argument is it's terrible for credibility um, in, in, in East Asia theater because we have just abandoned a partner. And if we've abandoned a partner, then all of the other partners look at us and think they're going to abandon us too. On the flip side, you might say, um, I'm here in East Asia and I'm tired of watching the American resources funneled into Afghanistan. And if I was really going to have confidence that America would be here for me to defend me, I would want to see this pivot to Asia happen. I'd want to see every indication that the U.S. is no longer interested in the Middle East, is no longer interested in Southeast Asia, and is going to reallocate its resources to my defense here in Taiwan. And so you can see both of those logical arguments that point in totally different directions. And it's an empirical question, and it's a difficult empirical question, you know, which one is more right. Um, and it might be different. There might be people in Taiwan, people in China who disagree. Some people might think, oh, this is great news for us. And others might think, oh, I see that they're now that they're now going to um, that they're going to really commit all in uh, to East Asia. So I would just kind of put that out there as it's a it's a tricky question. And anyone who kind of speaks very confidently to it, um, you might want to press and, and, and ask, well, how do you know? you know? What would it take to falsify that? How can you deal with that other argument? Um, and I also just wanted to add um, a point on the previous discussion that Paul and Jonathan had about just commitment and not committing. I just wanted to hammer a point that John made at the end, which is, um, you know, thinking about what the U.S. is trying to do in the world we, and how powerful the United States remains. You know, the United States can commit to managing a tricky problem that requires a lot of resources. And if it chooses to, it, it can. But should it is a totally different question. Like, what would the commitment take is is a prioritization question. If you're kind of taking a grand strategy class and thinking, I'm the United States, I'm trying to prioritize all of my competing interests in the world, uh, what would what does this commitment really entail? What would it take to accomplish that objective? And um, may and you might decide you might come to the conclusion that the commitment is not worth it given competing priorities. Or you might decide this is a really actually a, a very sustainable, you know, low resource intensive effort. But to say that the US didn't commit commit is not necessarily the end of the story. You have to say should 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 the US commit? Commit, um, as well. And then one last point on that prior conversation, um, just about the the fighting the one year, fighting a war 10 years, but it's all, it's 10 one year wars. And then we did that twice. Um, and these metrics, this um, kind of happy talking points about how well everything is going. Um, I just, what what is that, what is at the root of that? You know, what is going on? What's happening in the military bureaucracy that could be causing both of those symptoms? Because I think they're symptoms of, of a similar problem. And this is a bureaucracy problem. Bureaucracies get into rhythms. They like to do things they've been doing. They get their machinery going and they like to hit go. And this is not a necessarily specific to the military. All large bureaucracies tend to do this. So I would say this presenting happy progress and fighting the, the 10 year, 20 year war 20 times is, is really a bureaucratic bureaucracy problem. And that, that really, I think, needs to be kind of interrogated in a lot more in a lot more detail. Thank you. Nicely said, Rachel. John or Paul? or both of you, any comments on what our near peer adversaries might be learning for this, especially as it might relate to Taiwan? Um, I'll observe that I think that India likely believes that we have just ceded Afghanistan to Pakistan, and India is not happy about that. Um, China and Russia, I don't really know what they believe, but I know they see this as a propaganda opportunity. And they're going to play it up for all it's worth. They, the Chinese have already done so to the Taiwanese audience. And some of the audience might believe it. Now, I know uh, Rachel, I think, alluded to this, and she's right. 
the research doesn't really bear it out. All politics is local and most alliances are rooted in local realities. That's true. And that's why I keep going back to this idea about the, the global chessboard, right? It's not about who owns which square, but it is about the tempo, right? And China and Russia are going to use this to, to pick up a tempo on us. Um, not because Afghanistan is the most important square in the world, and it's not as if all things hinge on this, but, um, you know, every straw plays its role in breaking the camel's back and no one, you know, no, no straw takes responsibility for it, but we all know that each, every straw played its part. And so that's, that's the sense in which I worry about Afghanistan's role in the uh, broader culture of world order right now. I think you're still muted, Colonel. Yeah, sorry about that. A rookie mistake. Jonathan, anything to add before we move on? No, the points that I would have said have already been made. Thanks. Very good. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I see that we're about out of time. I wanted to make sure that we afforded the opportunity for our panelists to have any closing comments. And Rachel, you were last on the introduction, so we're going to start first with you for conclusion. So any closing comments in a minute or less? Rachel, go ahead. Minute or less. I'll, I'll I'll just start by uh, by thanking thanking everyone for the time uh, for the invitation and the, and the time today and your attention. Um, these are really complicated, difficult questions, and any any kind of any prescription is necessarily going to be focused on one small slice. Um, and so I wanted to echo Kyle's points at the beginning, where we really need to look at what went right and what went wrong, and not in a finger pointing mode because you know uh, failure has many fathers or or success has all the fathers or something like that. You know. You know where I'm going. Um, but this is a really important moment for introspection, and we don't want to do what we did um, in the past, which is run away from these projects thinking we'll never do them again, only to find ourselves doing them again and doing them again in the same way. So it's 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 up to people like uh, this this audience here today. This is this is your bailiwick. This is it's up to you to kind of look forward and to, to, to not make the same mistakes um, of this prior, prior generation. So so th thank you all. And it's lovely to meet all of you. Thank you for being here with us, Rachel. Jonathan, in closing observations or comments. I, I would just say, I mean, a follow on, I mean, again, thank, thank you all for your time here as well. This has been really fascinating. Uh, I, I would say a follow on question that I often get to my opening statement is, so is there anything that we did right in Afghanistan with respect to building the Afghan security forces? And one thing I would point to just quickly is, yes, we did build a very capable commando force and we built a very capable special mission wing. And the way in which we did that was a very different model than we tried to use for the Afghan army, the Afghan police, or even the Afghan Air Force, right? It was a it was a go small and go long approach as opposed to go big and go fast, which is the approach we use for the Afghan army, for example. So by having a dedicated partner unit for the Afghan partner unit that had consistent rotations, consistent relationships for a decade or more, you can build real capability that way in a foreign partner force. And we've done that in many other places around the, you look at the Iraqi counterterrorism force, the Danab battalion in Somalia, there's maritime security examples that my team has looked at that I could cite you, right? But that's how you build capability. So the US has got to get out of this mindset of playing, you know, of running after threats once they emerge, and then trying to throw huge amounts of resources at local security forces to try and go big and go fast after the threats once they've emerged. We need to get out of that mindset and try and get into a preventive medicine mode where we pick a specific unit or a specific part of the security sector and we focus intently on that in small but dedicated and sustained ways for longer periods of time. And we'll be able to build really capable units uh, that can have real impact on the ground if we switch to that kind of model. Great. Thank you, John. Paul, over to you. Um, I don't think I have anything to add, uh, except, to, again, thank you to everyone. And I enjoyed the questions from the audience. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would just be repeating myself if I said anything else. So I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Paul. And thanks for being here with us today. Kyle, go ahead and take us home. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I, I think the humility and objectives is a good place to stop because that directs where we're going to go in the future, right? Um, so I, I think um, to argue for isolation, isolationism right now would be a massive overcorrection. And I think a lot of the conversation is, hey, counterinsurgency, irregular warfare, that's what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
and that's done now. We're doing other stuff right now. And that would be a mistake. I think that if we look at history, we can accomplish some small things with small packages that are in line with U.S. interests. So, you know, kind of interesting fact is that U.S. special operation teams are in over 80 countries around the world doing security force assistance missions. It's not just Afghanistan and Iraq. And exactly as John said, sometimes staying low to go long is the way to kind of make these sustainable packages that can accomplish U.S. objectives. I think one of the lessons we should be examining from Afghanistan and maybe the surge in Iraq and Vietnam is if we try and go big, sometimes we make huge, big mistakes so we can go the wrong direction. And I think one of the interesting takeaways from the withdrawal from Afghanistan, is it, it's, it's easy to focus on the fact that the Afghan military collapsed, which is a terrible kind of you know, loss for the United States, given the effort and resources we poured into it. But another impressive thing is that before the Afghan army collapsed, for years beforehand, the U.S. had a, a pretty small package on the ground with a pretty small number of casualties of U.S. casualties, with small resources invested. And it was the second that those limited re U.S. resources withdrew that the company collapsed or the country collapsed, which to me says that we can do some things with these small packages. Now, whether that builds a long term partner force, whether that's reforming the internal politics of a country is another question. But I don't think we should forget that as an important lesson of what we can accomplish um, as a kind of positive thing. And then in closing for the cadets, since uh, I have to go, you know, uh, face your criticism on Monday in class and for my peers who are certainly going to let me have it. Um, my suggestion is that we keep talking about it and we don't let it kind of fade into the bad memory box of, hey, yeah, that's that's gone. Now we're shifting to this other thing. I think we need to capture these lessons because we're going to face this challenge again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kyle. And I think that's a great way for us to wrap this thing up. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our time. On behalf of the Modern War Institute, I want to express our gratitude to all of our panelists for a great discussion and to also thank our audience, especially the cadets, faculty and staff of the United States Military Academy at West Point. This concludes this iteration of the War Council. Thank you for your time.